Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, I am uh, I am delighted to uh, have the opportunity to to introduce Pat McCormick. Uh, Pat is chief counsel of the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, uh, and uh, uh, along with uh, 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 several other people, uh, several other of our late arrivals, probably was uh, uh, participating in the. Uh, hearing this morning to confirm two uh, new FERC commissioners and a deputy secretary uh, of energy. So um, uh, we are, uh, we're moving on in those, in those areas. Uh, Pat has uh, been a, a friend for a long time. Uh, he um, he uh, has worked on the committee, uh, oh gee, you know, a number of years, with, part was in private law practice and uh, 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 and uh, worked for or with uh, Southern companies. Uh, Pat is uh, uh, someone uh, I think you can rely on as a real straight shooter in the uh, in the Senate uh, environment, and uh, we rely on him quite a bit um, for uh, for his insights and his advice. So I'm not going to delay this any longer because he's done the favor of uh, moving his speaking slot uh, from, uh, from uh, 9.30 this morning until whenever, and now is whenever. So, uh, Pat, well, good to much. see you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I apologize for uh, not having been here this morning, but um, I, whenever I am invited to speak, I always say, of course, I will speak uh, unless there is official business that intervenes. And as, uh, as Pasha Majdi, who I see sitting over there, knows, who used to work on the committee staff, um, official business for us means whatever our chairman needs, whenever she needs it. And this morning, of course, we had a hearing uh, on the um, uh, confirmation of uh, Dan Bruyette uh, to be the Deputy Secretary of Energy, but perhaps of greater significance for this group, the two uh, FERC nominees, um, Rob Powson and Neil Chatterjee. And so as a consequence of that hearing, I wasn't able to uh, speak with you this morning, but I'm delighted to have the invitation. Um, now, I will begin with the standard disclaimer, um, which uh, the, the best expression of which I learned from one of my colleagues on the minority staff of our committee who said, uh, he said, of course, my views are my own only. I'm speaking only on my own behalf. And then he added, but if I say something that you like, thank my senator. And if I say something that you hate, blame me. So uh, with that thought, I'll go forward. I'm going to just uh, really talk for just a few minutes, and then I thought perhaps I'll just take your questions. Um, th your agenda is quite interesting and I think quite timely. Um, and, uh, you know, the economic policy and technology benefits of transmission investment is a subject that has been close to my heart for about 20 years. Uh, Jim Hecker may remember when he was the chairman of the FERC and uh, I was in private law practice and I represented a group of companies uh, including, uh, including uh, a man who, who, was, who, was who, who worked in the company along with Bob Horn is another guy here whose name is Joe Welsh and you, not, most of you probably know Joe but at that time he was uh, the manager of a, of a division inside uh, what, what was then Detroit, uh, what was DTE Energy Company. Uh, and uh, Joe was, was a visionary, and not only Joe, but we also had uh, companies, Jim mentioned Southern Company, but um, we had companies that, that now are on the other side of the issues that Wires is on. So it's kind of interesting. Um, but, but, but transmission investment, I believe is very, very intensely needed by the United States. And while we have um, an electric grid that is the envy of the world, um, it, as you all know better than most, uh, it, it needs a lot of help. And that's not to criticize anybody. I mean, Wires is free to criticize people. Uh, chief counsels of Senate committees do not. But, um, but but it is the case that the country is really in need of significant transmission investment and more transmission infrastructure, especially if 
We want the grid to do all the things that if you've been following the deliberations of our committee in, the, in just in this Congress alone, uh, it needs to do by way of strengthening the security of the grid, but also making it um, more um, flexible and better able to uh, accommodate the changing nature of the, of, of on the, on the resource side of the various electric resources and on the customer side of the various uses to which the customers uh, will increasingly want to uh, put their electricity to. So, um, so it's good to be with you in that regard. Uh, one of the things that the, this group that I formally represented, um, which, which by the way called itself the informal coalition, because in those days no one wanted to be associated, or maybe their CEOs wouldn't let them, with the idea of promoting transmission investment openly. And when you fill out a lobby disclosure form, uh, the form gives an example, at least it did in those days, of perhaps an informal coalition. So the group was known as the informal coalition. But the informal coalition uh, conducted a, um, a uh, congressional delegation educational opportunity uh, at Goldman Sachs on January 20th and 21st of 2000. And Andy Vesey, who's a guy that many of you probably know, used to be with Ernst & Young, and I haven't heard from Andy in a while, gave a presentation that um, I can share with your panelists, and I won't bore you with it, um, but it's fascinating. I pulled it out of my file um, as I was preparing these remarks because it is, after all, 17 years old. But it, um, it, it, uh, it said, Andy argued that transmission needed to be transformed uh, so that the transmission system, quoting Andy Vesey now, could be a network facilitating commerce in a competitive energy market where every consumer is a potential repackager and reseller and everyone is connected to the network, everyone connected to the network is a customer. And I thought that, looking at this from a perspective of 17 years, I thought, well, wow, that, that's pretty good. That's the good news for Andy. The bad news for the rest of us <laughs> is that we're still talking about it. And, uh, and so the question might arise, well, okay, so you work for the Senate. What, what, what are you willing to do about that? And again, as I pointed out at the beginning, uh, I don't have an election certificate. So, um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm, a, uh, I'm certainly a, someone who is keenly interested, but of course our senators are the ones that uh, decide about legislative priorities. However, I would say that um, our committee has been very keen, and our chairman, uh, for whom I work, uh, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, has been uh, very keen to see energy legislation move forward, uh, and in part, uh, really, to show that regular order can prevail and legislation can move forward. And we, we uh, had a pretty good year last year, but not, not good enough. Uh, we were able to get a bill through the Senate, 85 to 12, and we negotiated with the House at the staff level. Uh, we had the conferees met once or twice, but mainly uh, negotiations were at the staff level. And uh, we negotiated uh, at all but one or two, depending on whose point of view you adopt, of about 1,200 pages of legislative text. But the House wasn't able to take up the bill in the, in the time that we had. And so uh, we're, you know, we're eager to start again. Now, you might say, well, okay, what was in that bill for transmission? And the answer is, um, well, uh, I think uh, perhaps not as much as you would like, or, or I don't really know your legislative agenda as well as I ought to do. Um, but we, we did have uh, provisions that, um, that, would, um, that would strengthen cybersecurity, uh, that would, uh, and we were successful in the in the prior Congress of codifying the uh, authority of the Department of Energy to be the sector specific uh, agency for cybersecurity. I know that's not at the center of your agenda, but it's an increasing concern. Um, but we frankly weren't taking on any big ticket issues on transmission. Uh, actually, a provision on vegetation management on federal lands, which you'd have thought might have been an easy one turned out not to be easy at all. 
which gives you again, I mean, not, not again that this audience needs this, but it's, it gives you a sense perhaps of the difficulty of transmission issues. Um, after all, linear infrastructure is always controversial. Um, uh, fortunately, the Senate did not adopt uh, an amendment uh, to repeal a provision in the 2005 Act um, that was important to a number of transmission uh, developers, particularly Clean Line. Um, but, but the larger, bigger question is the problem with transmission is it affects all the other sectors of the electricity value chain. That's why transmission investment is so important, I think, and why a return on it is so good for the electric system. Um, that's the good news again, but the bad news is that has a political impact on everybody. It has a business impact on many, and that business impact turns into a political impact. So I guess I would say that um, regular order legislation is probably good. Not probably. It is good. It's good for the country, it's, and I would argue it's good for you. Um, but if you have a specific agenda, uh, the more specific you can be, the more targeted you can be, and the support you can build, uh, the more important that will, will be. In terms of the committee's agenda for this Congress, then, we want to get the energy bill moving. Senator Cantwell, who's a ranking member, and Senator Murkowski have agreed upon that, and they've been in public forums uh, recently saying that. And so after we get back from this uh, state work period, uh, look, for, look for some movement there, I, I hope and expect. Uh, the committee has other important roles. Of course, we have, uh, as, as the whole Senate has, the obligation of, um, well, senators, not, not staff, but senators have the constitutional obligation to give uh, their uh, advice and consent uh, to nominations that the president makes for appointments that he, that he would make for officers of the United States. Now, that's a mouthful. Why did I put it that way? And I put it that way to emphasize the seriousness of it. We've got, uh, we've got uh, about um, about three dozen presidential appointments that require Senate confirmation that are within the jurisdiction of the committee. And here we are four months into a presidential term and we've confirmed exactly two. Um, we have held hearings now uh, on four additional ones, including this morning the two FERC nominees. So the Senator is very committed to moving through the committee as quickly as possible the uh, nominees that we have and um, and she announced at the hearing those of you who weren't able to watch it that um, senators should expect that when we get back from the break uh, they will be asked to vote on the nominations that they have now had hearings on which would include the two FERC noms so obviously going over those nominees and and seeing that they're vetted and all that and then rendering our uh, what, what Senator Murkowski hopes will be our vigorous consent uh, and, and in FERC's case getting the agency past the quorum. It's deeply, deeply regrettable that President Obama chose not to nominate anyone to the com commission uh, who was a p of a party other than his own. And as Jim will tell you, having been chairman, or as maybe you know, the Federal Power Act requires that only three of the members of the commission may be of, of the president's party. So there was a longstanding tradition. I, I, I think um, there may have been one occasion where the Federal Power Commission was without a quorum. I don't think the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission was ever without a quorum. You, you may want to correct me. Maybe a very short time. Well, never happened, actually, in place. That's yeah. what Burke said. Yeah, that. I think the FPC I maybe. I suggested it might have been a few days, and I was aggressively admonished. Um, <laughs> so the point being that there's been a tradition that when the president, uh, that the president will nominate even those members who are not of his party. President Obama chose not to do that. Um, Commissioner Moeller left in 2015, about two years ago, Commissioner Clark in 2016, and no nominees. And then, of course, that was a risk of no quorum, and that risk uh, uh, came into reality when um, Commissioner Bay resigned uh, well in advance of the time that his term was over. So we're in the regrettable situation of no quorum. Senator Murkowski says, has told the President and everybody else and as much as they would listen, uh, she wants to get that done. And she said that again this morning. So we're hoping to move that along. 
Uh, the third thing that the committee does is oversight. And here's where I think maybe, uh, you know, some further, and this is why the, the deliberations of this conference could be important. I know this is Wires University. I know you have another conference later in the summer. I guess this is the graduate school of Wires University, so I, that's why I'm assuming a high level of uh, knowledge about these things. But, but I think, you know, the kinds of topics you're discussing here are ones that I think our senators uh, will benefit from hearing. And I would really encourage you to keep that dialogue going. Um, so committee's agenda for the year, get the energy bill restarted. Um, and in your case, that'll be look out for floor amendments. Uh, maybe, uh, and then, of course, do confirmations. In your case, that would be, let's get these FERC noms across the line. Let me just say, let me digress here very briefly, to say that um, I think they're qualified, well qualified. Uh, Neil Chatterjee is more personal to me because I've worked with him for five years, and he's uh, Senator McConnell's energy policy advisor. And he, as the senator said at our hearing just a little while ago, he is really known for being a consensus builder. And indeed, when Senator McConnell introduced him this morning, he quoted Senator Boxer in a nice letter that Senator Boxer had written to him. And she finished that letter by saying, I hope this won't ruin his career that I'm praising him. Uh, <laughs> but um, but he's, he's worked with almost every senator on our committee, Republicans and Democrats alike. And I think that kind of consensus building, again, as Jim could tell you, and I, you know, I was a, a, a more junior guy when I worked at the commission. Um, obviously much more junior than chairman, um, although I did have the job that Jim had when he was a staff guy. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, and uh, at least in the days when, when I worked at the commission, and I think if you talk to Cheryl LaFleur, she would say this is really needed ever more so, commissioners who really want to engage with one another on the substance of the matters that are before them. Um, uh, Senator Murkowski has said repeatedly now for years that what she really wants from FERC is to be the expert agency that we all know that it is and, and, and should be. And that it, she always says, you know, if FERC were more boring, that's a good, a good thing. That's a good thing. And so, um, and so with, with Neil, I think you, you have somebody who's a consensus builder. I would say with respect to Rob Palson, I don't know Rob as well as I know Neil. I've known him through industry things and, and through he serves on the advisory committee of EPRI and he's been active in NARUC and so I've met him in those circles and he's very well regarded by his colleagues. He did well at the hearing this morning. He was very uh, conversational. He, he praised those things in the agenda of Chairman Wellinghoff and and Chairman Bay that he could praise. Uh, of course, he has his own policy views, and they're distinct. But again, I, it seemed to me that 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 was a good that was a good tone to strike. And so Senator Murkowski very 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 much in favor of him as well. And so, if you all are concerned about this question of the quorum, I think it's very very important immediately to get to senators, particularly on the Democratic side. You know, and here's maybe where, again where Jim's help can be useful to you on the Democratic side to, to make the point that, um, you know, the, the longstanding tradition, the, the constitutional, uh, not standard, it's really more of a practice, but the constitutional practice o over the vast history of the country for almost all senators has been uh, and this is particularly true for independent agencies or for courts, that what we look for are people who are qualified. And if they are qualified, well then their policy views will be what their policy views are. So um, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, the, the, reason we, uh, we, the reason we have not confirmed more nominees, of course we, we haven't gotten nominees on the pace that's, that we would like, um, fair enough. But the two noms that we had right out of the box, the, the uh, cabinet secretaries, uh, in contrast to their predecessors in the first Obama term who were confirmed by UC unanimous consent on inauguration day, were not confirmed until, in the case of Secretary Zinke, late February, and in the case of Secretary Perry, early March. So, you know, Senator Reid changed the rules so that uh, you couldn't filibuster a nomination and so now the minority party's uh, only way to 
express its displeasure perhaps on whatever nominee it wants to is to slow down the process for all of them. And that's unfortunate. And so if you can, I think, discuss with uh, Democrats um, the importance of getting on with the business of the agency, I think that would be very helpful. Um, so, so, so of course, again, uh, are getting the noms done and then in oversight, always open for your ideas on that. And so with that, I'll, I'll stop and, and, uh, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Questions for Pat? Uh, let me ask you two completely unfair things. Oh, actually, I think there was one. Oh, oh, make it that. Yeah, there was one over there. Okay. Well, on, on May 4th, uh, you know, Chairman Murkowski and your committee organized an excellent uh, hearing on EMP vulnerability of the grid and, and so on. And a number of us uh, over the last year at the Climate Institute and a number of environmental Native American groups and, and uh, you know, grid security groups have really been looking at the possibility of combining something that would be very good for bringing in more wind and, and solar energy by essentially interconnecting the three U.S. alternating current grids with a, an HVDC overlay, burying the bulk of it underground and traveling around, uh, traveling as, as much as possible along uh, existing rights of way, highway rights of way, railroad rights of way, so you could cut a decade or so from the, you know, the time because you're not dealing with 20,000 landowners, you're dealing with a handful of, of, of governors and uh, railways and utilities. And, uh, you know, I, I, I wondered, uh, do, you, do you think there would be a lot of receptivity in the Senate for this combined approach that builds a kind of broad-based coalition for grid reform uh, from environmental groups on one side and from generally right of center security groups on the other? Well, uh, I think coalitions, uh, assuming they really are substance based, are always helpful, it, it, you know, to the extent you're bringing people with disparate points of view and different political philosophies together, I think that that's a good thing. Um, uh, you know, so I, I, we, center always encourages people to, to come together when they can, so I, I would say, say yes on the question the larger question of you know linear infrastructure and how you cite it that's an enormously complex question and I think you know here again I think groups like yours have a lot of have a lot a lot of good thoughts to offer I'm sure about that um, and so I'll just leave it at that I'll also say that I participated in a conference uh, that was organized by by CIRA in I think some like 2002 or 2003 about how what would happen in the future of transmission and they, they had all these people that they invited to come and, uh, uh, and and the group basically deliberated for a couple of days and concluded that transmission unfortunately was going to have to muddle along for 10 or 15 years and then somebody would come up with the idea of putting a DC grid over top it and I remember thinking at the time wow that's really depressing <laughs> 15 years of muddling along but the DC thing could be really interesting. <laughs> and so your question is really, uh, really an interesting one. I'm sorry to go on. I know you have the no. panel. And, uh, did you want to add, you had another question you wanted to ask? We always have other questions. Um, but you had one. I did. I, I wanted to answer, I wanted to ask you something that you may not be able to answer, but uh, I will anyway. What do you think um, uh, w uh, the receptivity um, uh, would be to, uh, uh, delegation of uh, FPA or Energy Policy Act 221 backstop siting authority. The delegation of the DC part of that, which involves, uh, you know, the uh, the congestion right. uh, determinations, uh, to FERC. Since FERC is, in your chairman's uh, view, the place where expertise really is. Yeah, I have not discussed that with the chairman, but I have heard that idea. And, and, I, and I had a really interesting conversation with Joe Kelleher about it, actually. And, um, and again, speaking for myself, um, uh, you know, I think that's an idea that ha has a lot of promise. But um, I think that, um, that uh, you know, that's, I'll just leave it at that. I'll just leave it at that. I think, I think it has a lot of promise. I think as a tactical matter, there are perhaps some things that 
people who are in favor of it won't, would want to think about, and we could talk about that later. Okay. Do you have any sense of whether adding the transmission of uh, BPA and WAPA and SEPA to FERC's jurisdiction by selling off those assets, as the President proposes, whether that would be something uh, uh, the committee would uh, view favorably? Well, Senator Cantwell doesn't, right? She's already sent a letter, um, you know, expressing her, her deep, deep, deep concern about that. And, um, and, and those of us who are around know, I, I'm thinking about Bob Horn, who, you know, has been an expert in these things for years. I mean, that, that idea has been proposed previously, and it, it, hadn't, uh, it hadn't done very well. But, um, but we'll see, I guess. Yeah. Uh, other questions for? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Jack Warner, uh, we know that the DOE's got the study underway to take a look at how renewables might affect the reliability and the security of the transmission system as it gets integrated more into the power system, power supply system. Is this is the committee willing to take a look at that whole issue itself? And to determine whether microgrids, the in, you know the addition of renewable energy technologies into the power network is going to uh, be positive or negative as it relates to security and, li and reliability of the system. Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I have several reactions to it. The first one is that the committee doesn't do independent studies, and we don't do investigations very often, and, and very, none in the time that I've been. We do have a pretty vigorous um, hearing schedule, and we have conducted hearings on the electricity system. Um, we, had, we had two in the last Congress. We had one in the Congress before that. Um, we've had these cyber, we had, we've had, we had a cyber hearing and a, at the full committee level, we had a, a cyber hearing on the electric grid at the subcommittee level, and we had the EMP hearing. Um, so the committee is, and, and Senator Murkowski herself, is very merits-based. And, you know, if you go on our website, it's, it's out of date now, but Pasha was involved in this and was very helpful in it. Um, there's a report there called Energy 2020. Um, which is now a little bit out of date, but it's, it's 120 pages of energy policy, including a good section on transmission and dis distribution and energy delivery. So Senator Murkowski herself is open to, you know, un understanding more deeply the matters. I mean, for example, the, the uh, efforts of ATC in Alaska have gotten her attention in a, she's, she's following, as an Alaskan, she's following that, she's interested in it. So we have an appetite for understanding the issues more deeply. We, we don't really have the bandwidth to conduct studies ourselves. And so what we do, I mean, there's only, there's only about 40 people on the committee staff when you include both the majority and the minority. On the majority side, I think we've got 21. And then, of course, we have the whole range of the committee's jurisdiction. Um, but but we do, uh, we, you know, we did, when we were in the minority, we did a series of white papers. We did one on electric reliability, indeed. Um, uh, but but I, I, I don't see us conducting our own study. I, I, I'm eager to see what the department comes up with. We haven't really talked with them about it. Uh, what I know about it is probably what you know about it in terms of, its, of, its, of, of the mem memorandum that Se uh, Secretary Perry got from his chief of staff. Yes, I, I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me. I'm sorry I didn't mention that. Actually, I should have. That's one, that's dear to Senator Murkowski's heart um, because of Alaska. I mean, you know, so in Alaska, the most of the population lives in what's called the Rail Belt, which is a region, you know, 350 miles or so from from uh, well, maybe a little more than that, actually, from Fairbanks down to the bottom of the Kenai Peninsula. That group, that 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 area has a very 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 rudimentary grid system. It's almost like you might have found in the lower 48 in the 1930s or 40s. Um, and it has a load center that's, you know, roughly the size, well, it's a, it's, uh, you know, it's a couple thousand megawatts maybe. Uh, um, 
And then in the rest of Alaska, the, the, the places are not on the grid at all. And it's really almost like a third world situation. And so microgrids are really crucial. And, um, and, and frankly, there's a lot of really good, innovative stuff. I'm so glad for your question, because I, I actually had that in my prepared remarks, which I didn't use, because I was going to try and be brief, and now I've used up my time. So, so anyway, what's your, what, what specifically would you like to know about? Yeah. There's no, there's no mention of direct current in, the, in that bill. There isn't. You're right. And we need direct current Well, this is the second part, part of the definition. I'd like to hear, maybe later we can talk about what your ideas are on direct current. I think that, that would be a good thing. Okay. Okay. Just, just direct current in the definition of microgrids in that bill or whatever comes out of that bill. Okay. Well, let's talk Please. about that. We, Thanks. Let's talk about that yeah. later. Yes. So uh, wait, wait for the microphone so we can get you... I'm so this is fine. We'll okay. make this the last question. Okay. So Alaska uh, Electric Cooperative have areas they're serving are not accessible by roads. Transmission lines are hard to build. Yes. Minto is the only location that has access by road, right? Isn't it? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last one. I think year. Minto is the only one road that has access to uh, the road from one city to other, otherwise you have to fly or take yeah, a the, ship. Yeah, the road system, like 85% of Alaska communities are not on the road so system. So are you looking at drones or AI technologies to actually develop any transmission lines, new ones to avoid well, building really good, bridges? Uh, uh, yeah. we're not specifically, but at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, there is a very, um, very <laughs> forward-looking drone program, and the person who heads it is a um, is a PhD who was a fellow on our committee staff for about 18 months, and we are all following her work very closely. And it, it, Senator Murkowski is very interested in the, uh, the what drones can do to just generally to improve um, to improve things. And so I hadn't. I, I know some people are using drones to do uh, overflights of transmission to be sure that that the system that the that the lines are not being encroached upon and such. But I'm I'm not, and I'd like to learn more when there's more time about how it is that drones can help in the transmission space. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you very much. All right, thank you.